There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the Spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know that it's the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet... morning. We're glad to welcome everyone here this morning. As soon as I get the mic on. Glad to have everyone here this morning. Appreciate everyone's attendance. It's good to welcome you here. They're, t they're still telling me the mic's not on. Good morning. You want me to? You want me to put it in third gear? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll use this mic. It's. I don't think it's any better. <laughs> I can talk. To that. I hope we don't have this trouble when I get ready to do Sunday school class. I won't be able to talk that long. <laughs> okay. Now they're... Good morning. We're glad everyone's here this morning. I now, now we're now we're here. There's there's five people upstairs now, so I guess they, we're ready to go. Glad to have everyone here this morning. Appreciate your attendance today and on this the 16th of May, the day before uh, tax day. Uh, for those of you who. Uh, or haven't filed your income tax returns yet. Tomorrow's the deadline for those of you who might be a little bit behind, so you might want to get that done. This unusual year this year with that, usually it's April the 15th, but they gave us all an extra month to uh, get our taxes squared away. We're glad to have everyone here today. We appreciate your attendance. I've got a few birthdays to give you for this week. Courtney Ferris's birthday is on the 18th. Dorothy Hatchett is the 18th, Brittany Dalton is the 19th, Becky Colvin is the 21st, and Peggy Brown is the 22nd. Anniversaries this week are David and Judy Ewing's anniversary is the 18th. Now before we begin our service, let's have prayer and then Bart will come back and lead singing. Father, thank you for the great privilege we have on this day, the first day of the week, to come together to worship you. We pray your blessings on us in this worship that we may all do all things according to your word. We ask now that you'll be with us, bless us, and keep us and protect us as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're using a book this morning, we'll sing number 55, Beyond This Land of Parting, number 55.
Servant of the Lord, so before Corey Crow comes in, I believe it's Corey, who presides over the Lord's Supper, number 511.
If you did not receive a communion packet or get one on your way in, if you would, if you want to raise your hand so that you can uh, be served one so that you have a communion packet. John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So fascinating that Jesus knew at that moment that all things were accomplished. That he knew that, that we would receive salvation through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that he knew at that moment it is finished. That all our sins were paid for on that cross all those years ago. So this morning, as we do every Sunday morning, we have an opportunity to Remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Let's pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for everything you do, all the things that you give us in life and blessings that you bless us with. God, we pray that we would take this bread in a manner that is pleasing to you, that we would remember Christ's death on the cross. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Again, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for all the blessings you give us, God. And what a wonderful thing it is that we can partake of this cup and remember the blood that was shed that covers our sins. God, you were so good and so giving to us, and we are so thankful for that, God. And we pray again, Lord, that this would be done in a manner pleasing to you, that our hearts and minds would put away the things of this week and the things going on in our lives that we think are important and remember the true importance of Christ's death and blood that was shed on our behalf. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, the elders have set aside this time to lay on store just a portion of what we've been given and blessed with. Um, there are ways to give online, as um, is on the board or on the screen behind me, and also in the bulletin, I believe. Um, or you, we will pass the trays to the ends of the aisle, and we just ask that you, um, if you want to, would give at that time. So, if we would, let's have a prayer for the offering. Our gracious and holy Father, Lord, we have already said again and again how much you've blessed us with, God, and we could say it time and time again, and it would never be enough to acknowledge all the blessings and all the things that you give us. God, we could never repay what you've done. We could never give back enough. Um, God, but we pray that we would do so in a cheerful manner, with a glad heart, Lord, and that we would focus on giving uh, because we want to. God, not because we have to, but because you gave so much for us that we want to give back to you. Again, Lord, we just thank you for the blessings that you've given us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
What our next song is going to be number 799. 799. Oh, 
Christian brothers and sisters and, and worship you. But we pray that this, uh, this worship service will be pleasing in your sight and, and it'll uplift each and every one of us here. But we do ask that you continue to bless the church that meets here in Charlotte Heights. Lord, please help us to continue to, to grow and to spread your word and as, as well as to grow stronger in your word at the same time. Lord, we pray that you be with those who are are sick at this time and just ask you to bless them and comfort them, Lord, and to heal them so that they can be back with us as soon as possible. And we ask that you also be with those who have lost loved ones recently. To bless them and to comfort them and help them through this time. But we do ask that you a special blessing on our elders here as they've led us led us through this incredibly difficult time with the pandemic and, and beyond. Lord, we're, we're so thankful that it appears that, that this is, is going away. And Lord, we ask you, you bless these men and their families as, as they lead us in the future, and that they will make the, the best decisions for this church, Lord, and that we will all grow, grow stronger and closer to you because of it. We ask that you be with Josh and Corey as they minister to us, to bless them, and the Lord, please bless each and every member here as, as, as we can grow closer together, Lord, and, and closer to you at the same time. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are using the book this morning, our invitation song will be 337 after Josh's lesson. Uh, but before he comes and before our Bible reading, uh, number 937, I ask you if, you if it's convenient to do so if you can, would you stand for this song and remain standing for the reading of the scripture? from 1 Samuel chapter 25 verses 23 through 26 and 32. Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. 
So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this inequity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please not, let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord with whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed, and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. You may be seated. Thank you. Again, we are studying in the month of May, godly women that exemplify God's word. And please don't tune out, tune out if you think, well... <clears throat> I'm not married, or I don't have a wife, I'm not a wife. This still applies to us. What, what John read from us is such a strong speech given at a very volatile time. Here's a man that's in wrath. He's not just angry, he's wrathful. And he wants to, to wipe out all of the male population that is on Nabal's uh, property and Nabal especially. So I want you to think about as we're looking at in the roles and responsibilities that these godly women that we are examining here in the month of May and what they teach us. When I think about a godly wife, I think about the example that we see in Abigail in 1 Samuel chapter 25. You know, when God created the world and created us, he he gave a command to Adam. He said that you can eat of every fruit of the tree that's in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And after that, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God looked at Adam and said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. And he does this that to provide a solution. To Adam's loneliness, a helper comparable to him. In creating Eve, he didn't create a part of Adam's from his head to create Eve. He didn't create a part from Adam's foot to create Eve. He, he created Eve based on a rib, the side of Adam. And I want you to think about it, the side to side. Taking from his rib and creating woman. What symbolic that should stay of marriage being teamwork, between a relationship between a man and a woman. In fact, the command that God gave in this marriage, that man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Since Eve, we we've, we've see in our scriptures women, men, husbands, wife, and the roles that they played in the time that they lived in. Some were great examples, some not so much so. And some marriages were, well, to be quite honest, were lopsided. And we'll look at that as we look at with Abigail. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, as we find, Abigail lived that role that God intended. I want to make a helper comparable to you. She was a helpmate. She was a helper to her spouse. And as we see in her example, it begs the question as we stand apart from our lives, if we are married, if we are engaged, if we are dating, if we even were single, think about these questions. Do I listen to my spouse? Do I listen to my close friends? Do I listen to the person that I'm engaged to? Do I value their judgment? And what they bring to the table. Because you never know, it may just save our life. It saved the life of Nabal and it saved the life of, of David. As we look at Abigail, there are three things that I want you to see in how she demonstrated 
in her godly ways in being that helper, helping not just her husband, but also helping soon to be the king whom Samuel already anointed. The first thing I want you to look at is this. She helped her foolish husband. Nabal's name literally means fool, and he was foolish in his actions. But in 1 Samuel chapter 25, we get the death of Samuel, and Samuel was an extraordinary individual as he lived the life in guidance and the son of Hannah, and Hannah brought him back and gave him to God and grew him there up in the temple and having, you know, anointing Saul, but now anointing David as well. He passes away and they're lamenting. But then we go and we're taken into, beginning in verse 3, into Carmel. And we're no, we see the, the family there of Nabal and Abigail. And notice how they're described there in verse 3 of 1 Samuel chapter 25. We get Abigail's description first. She, she is of understanding. Some translations translate that as she's intelligent. And her appearance is beautiful. Her name means my father is joy. In truly symbolic way that she was a joy to the heavenly father, God and how she carried out her role, and how she demonstrated herself. Nabal, whose name means fool, notice how he's described. He's described as being harsh and evil in his doings. His servants would describe him as a scoundrel. As was read in our text, Abigail in front of David, she says, my husband, he's a scoundrel. His name means fool. And yet, you think about this marriage, you can't help but think what a a vast, great, big mismatch between two people. What a lopsided relationship. Where Abigail brings so much and Nabal brings so little. But you got to remember, this was a culture and a time in, in part of the world where marriages were arranged. It wasn't a courtship. But let's not forget, even in a courtship, it doesn't automatically mean that both people in the relationship, in the marriage, bring the same. It doesn't mean that, that in that marriage that, that, that it is a partnership, it is a helping relationship, it is a teamwork. You see, the divorce rate is high as it is. And blended families because of that. And so even though it's a courtship, doesn't necessarily guarantee that in the relationship, in the marriage, that both bring their same weight. Both are helping each other. Both are working together. Both have come together as one flesh. Yet as we think about this story, we see the importance of, of Abigail and how even though her husband was not a, known as a great man in his great dealings, it didn't keep her away from her role and her responsibility in being a helpmate. And she lived that out. As we continue to see this, David knew of Nabal's wealth. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He knew of it because at one time he protected his investment. He protected him, his, his, all his livelihood and his stock. That not, nothing harmed it. And so David sends some servants to Nabal and, and sends them in, in a way, in peace. And he doesn't, he doesn't tell his servants to tell him, I want, I want ten of your sheep. And, and you, you owe me ten of your sheep because we protected you at one time. That none, none of your animals were harmed. He doesn't do that. He says, whatever you can give, could you give to us? He comes in a very respectful way, sending his servants to Nabal. Again, noticing that it was done in a very respectful, professional way that David sends them. Not, not forcing it, not, not demanding it, not telling him, I want this certain percentage. You can afford this since you are a man of wealth. Yet look at verses 10 and 11 of 1 Samuel 25. Notice what a foolish person does. He said a foolish thing. 
extremely foolish, that set a chain of commands which reminds us of our words and the power of the tongue. He said to the servants to say back to David, Who is this David, son of Jesse? He knew David. He knew David's lineage. He's the son of Jesse. But yet he says, Who is this David? Who is this son of, uh, of Jesse? You know, how is it that, you know, I'm hearing more about servants breaking away from their masters. Yet, he wants me to bring him bread and, and water and meat from the shears. When I don't know where they come from. That's a foolish statement, isn't it? And it reminds us that even in our day-to-day -day life, that it doesn't take much, listen to me, it doesn't take much to offend someone. You don't have to say a whole lot to do that, especially in our world today. Yet in our words, we know and reminded in Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. This is an example of death words. Because David, when he heard what Nabal had to say, he was more than furious. He was wrathful. He was so angry that he said to his men, gird up your swords. And if you read, he took with him 400 of his men with their weapons. He was ready to battle. He was ready to wipe out. He, he was so upset and so angry, he wanted vengeance because of what he said and how he di was disrespected by Nabal. Now notice the situation. Abigail was warned by the servants. They said, this scoundrel who you can't even speak to, he said this, he did this. What is a faithful godly wife do in a situation like this when you bring much more to the marriage than your spouse? Would she say and think to herself in that moment, you know what, he deserves this. Let him get what he deserves. Maybe this is God's will that he said something so foolish because he is known to be foolish. Maybe he, this is God's will that he ends up like this. I'm here to tell you, I don't think she thought any of those ways. I don't think she looked at it that way because, again, she's a godly wife. What do godly wives do in situations like this? Again, God said to Adam, I will make a helper, a helpmate comparable to you. She helped. She helped her, 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 her husband, even though he didn't deserve to be helped. Even though he didn't earn her help, she helped him anyway. She gathered enough food to literally feed an army. And the Bible says she didn't make haste. And she goes out. And she goes out with great courage, knowing the situation, what he says, but not knowing what how David responded in such a very wrathful way, carrying with him 400 men. Didn't know that part. But again, she helped her foolish husband because she's a godly wife. She's a godly woman. She exemplified you still help regardless because that's what you do. The second thing that I want to share with you is this. Not only did she help her husband in trying to save him from his foolish words, but she was a help to her furious soon-to-be king. Abigail's help went beyond her husband. She would confront David by the serious mistake that her husband made by her words. And I love, as was read to us, and what she said and how she said it again, David was furious, wrathful. He was ready to kill. In fact, he even made a, a, a promise, a pledge, that we're going to kill all the males that belong to Nabal. We're going to wipe them out. He was, he was wrathful. This was a hostile situation. You ever been confronted someone that are, that are not just angry, they're, they're, they're full of wrath? 
that have enough power to, to wipe out something, to, to eliminate something. And, and here she is by herself on a donkey with, with, with other donkeys full of food. And notice how she presents herself. Notice how this godly wife was a help to David. She approaches him. She comes down. She bows down before him. She, she does so in showing humility. She asks, notice, she doesn't force David to listen. She asks him to listen. She says please multiple times in what she's saying to her. She goes beyond that. She, she says of her husband's sin to take it upon herself. And she asks for forgiveness because of what was said. She does more than that, though. She, 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 we see more of her intelligence and her wisdom here in this speech. A again, I would assume she's scared and staring at David's eyes and how they're full of wrath and that, that he is, he is on, on, on a path, on a journey to, to kill. He's bloodthirst. And as she looks at him, she reminds David of his identity. Think about that for a moment. That you have been chosen by God. You will soon, you know, going to be a king. And you're going to be called to fight the Lord's battles. And, and, and you're going to become king of Israel. That what you're about to do may... They hinder that in a way that with your reputation, your present action, and what you're wanting to do in the moment could hinder this future glory. Don't let things like pride and revenge get in the way of what is truly God's plan for you. Angry and letting your anger, don't let act out upon that. I think about what her advice is saying and how she's pouring out this heart of wisdom. It's so true for us as she approaches and as she asks. We can learn from much from her actions. She, she, don't, don't do anything when you're upset, when you're so angry. May, uh, just rashful, harsh decisions. It's so true that how how we're out of control that we don't make our best decisions in those moments. When we're out of control, when we're full of anger, when we're, we're wanting revenge, we don't make our best decisions. Think about what Abigail is saying to David for us in our well. Think about what you're about to do in this moment. Don't think about what you want and the satisfaction you can receive in the moment. Think a little bit down the road to the consequences, whether good or bad. What could come from that? Oh, what a, what a wise thing to listen to this godly wife and what she's saying. Not to her husband, what she's saying to her future king. This furious king. Would we regret what we were about to do in this moment? Would we later down the road regret what we are about to do? Is our actions in such a way that maybe we are outside of God's guidance? We are outside of God's will for us? That we're being moved strongly by emotion only? Not really giving much thought of what we're doing? Yet I ask you this, can we be as big as David to listen to the advice of someone else? He blessed and thanked God for her. He blessed God for her advice. He did more than listen. He took it upon himself to do just that. He didn't go to wipe out the ball. He didn't go to wipe out all the male servants. And we know the story. If, if, if Abigail, this godly wife, hadn't have done what she had done, then 
David wouldn't have been stopped. Not that day. He would have carried out what he said. His respect and his honor, his reputation was harmed and hindered. It was pride. But David was better for listening and following what this godly wife had to say. It's amazing. Would would Abigail go back home and would they hear about what she had done? How they'd spared the lives of all the male, including her husband? Would they have a feast in her honor? Would they celebrate her? When Nabal said, I have missed... I have been blinded. I have taken advantage of you. I have not appreciated who you are and how how blessed I am to have you. Would that happen? It should have happened. But it didn't. Again, the reality of life and relationships today that we think it's not like a movie. It's not like how everything everybody gets together and everybody lives happily ever after. This is not a movie. This is reality. Now she goes home, there's a feast, but it's not a feast in her honor. It's her husband. He's so intoxicated, he is so drunk, that he doesn't even realize what has just happened. He can't even process what has happened. His precious wife literally saved him. Without even knowing about it. Not at that time. She had no, he had no idea what she, where she was at, what she had done, what she had prevented and stopped. She couldn't even speak to him that night because he was so drunk. The very next day in the morning when he was more sober, she told him what she had done and what had happened. And the Bible says, and it's interesting, it's interesting wording and exactly what that looked like. It's, it's almost like his spirit, even though he's still alive, his spirit just left him. His heart failed him and he became like stone. It, the moment she said to him what she did for him. I, I can't help but think, do we appreciate, if we're, those of us, do we appreciate our spouse? And maybe I need to put, have we let them know how much we appreciate them? In our, in our culture today, you, you chose to be married. You chose to marry that person. You chose to be engaged. You've made that decision on your own. No one forced you. Now that you're married, do you appreciate them? Do you value? And those of us who are not, those of you that are not married, think about this for a moment. What about what do you bring? The value that you bring in for the sake of others when it comes to close friendships, when it comes to whether in the work, whatever that is, do we, do we appreciate the people that are in our lives that I believe God has put into our place do we value them? Do we appreciate them? Have we let them know that? Or like Nabal, do we feel like, you know what, we take it for granted. We just assume. We just go through our life, go through the day-to-day -day lives. He was more concerned about his wealth, about his animals, about his investment than he was about the most precious commodity that he had. And that was his wife, his godly wife. And Nabal would learn the hard way that you don't, Nabal would learn the hard way that you don't. At the end of your life, it's not about your investments. It's not about what you've owned or what you've accomplished. It's about the people and the connections you've made in life. The third thing and final thing for your consideration is this. She helped her faithful Lord. How did she do that? She helped God by helping God's anointed one, David. David was going to make a big mistake, a tremendous mistake because of his pride, because of his anger leading to wrath, because of his willingness to wanting to go in, in this bloodshed, because he was disrespected. 
he was insulted. Now, would God miss this? No, God doesn't miss the single things that we do, no matter how big or how little. Think about the story that we find here. Saul, who was king at the time, wasn't aware of the story. David wasn't aware of what was happening on the other side, not at the time. But God was fully aware of everything, both sides, people involved. He was aware of it all. And God continues to be aware of everything that we do in His name, whether it's in word or in deed. We were told that. Do all in the name of the Lord. God knows. God knows our actions. Abel wasn't dead immediately. It went, when his heart failed him, when, when he we became like stone as if his life was just sucked out of him, but still living. He still lived for ten days. And I don't know. I don't know if he was able to communicate. I don't know if he could, if he was able to think. I don't know if that was ten days of, 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 of God's limited patience with him. I don't know if, if he could have said something. If he had the opportunity to say something, would he in that moment say, I'm sorry? I'm sorry that I haven't been the spouse that I should have been for you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I took you for granted. I'm sorry that I was more focused on my business than I was about you. I'm sorry that I overlooked the value of who you are and what you brought to the real. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Was this a ten day window for God to say, here's how much time you have. It's limited, but this is how much time you have to change, to repent. We do see God's mercy here. We do see a level of God's grace. But we also see in this story how it has a limitation to it. God's not, His patience is, is, is great, but it, it has a limit to it. There's a point in time and day which the God knows when He will come again. Christ will come again and the, as life as we know it will cease. His patience will be up. Just as it was up on that tenth day when Nabal died. As I think about and looking at this story again, when, when, when before the funeral was barely over, David heard about what was going on and and he proposes to Abigail, and he saw something that, unfortunately, her husband at the time did not see in her. I think the lesson of this story is, as we think about her and her role that she played in her godliness, that we appreciate the ones that we have in our life. Have we prayed to God and thank God for them and what they mean to us and the things that they do for us? I know it's not a perfect world and life's not perfect and sometimes it doesn't work out. Life shows us that. But the relationships that you do have, the people that you are tied to and connected to, do they value you, but, but more importantly, do you also value them, and have you communicated that? Because I would say in, in the realm of in any, anything, but especially in relationships, don't assume. Don't assume. And as I think about earthly relationships, it reminds me of the greatest relationship, and that's with Jesus Christ. Jesus loves us. His expression of love was demonstrated while we were sinners. Christ died for us. But don't you think He wants to hear that from us? Don't you think He wants us to not only thank Him, but to praise Him, to express our love for Him? 
Yeah, you bet. He wants that. He wants that relationship. And we can be adopted into God's family because of what He did for us. And I would say anything, if you go and look at the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, but it begins with before that, love God. It starts with God and our relationship with God and how we engage God in that relationship and then it filters throughout every other relationship. So we need to think about and regroup. And as we think about the story of old in 1 Samuel 25 that's buried there in the Old Testament, what a rich lesson for us when we think about the people and who I am. I say sometimes to, to people when they're asked, especially in the school system, hey, I don't have a friend. Hey, people don't like me. Okay? But if you want a friend, maybe you need to try to be a friend. Maybe you need to try to be like a bull. Maybe the problem is not with others. Maybe the problem is with you. Maybe. As we think about our life, that is the problem of sin, isn't it? It's with us. It's how we separate ourselves from God. Not God, God hasn't left us. We have left Him. But the good news, the Gospel, is that we can be restored. We can be reconciled. We can be renewed. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. You want to have a better relationship with others? Start with God. Start with God. Start with your relationship with God. Value that relationship. Uphold that relationship. Be faithful to that relationship. And it will translate to others. Maybe there's someone here online or in person. Maybe you, it's time for to respond, to rethink, to examine maybe some things. Maybe you have taken advantage of some things. Maybe you've taken things for granted. Maybe you've taken people for granted. No time to examine ourselves in the faith to see where we stand. No time to examine the things that we've said and the things that we've done. Has it been a part of God's guidance? Has it been a part of God's will? Or has it been our own will? Jesus came to live and die to give us hope and life in Him. To embrace Him. He said to Nicodemus, Unless one is born of water and spirit, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The watery baptism that we read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The importance of that, to repent, believe, confess, and be baptized. But the most important step that we sometimes don't mis- mention that is after that is the, the longest step, and that is to be faithful, to be dedicated, to be engaged in that relationship, to build upon it, to grow in it. That's the majority of our life as Christians. If we can help assist anyone, whatever you may have amiss in your life, again, the invitation song is selected. You can respond online. You can respond here in person. Please come. Together we all stand and sing.
As we close our song service this morning, number 847. Find us together, Lord, find us together. missed all of you and it's good to see so many faces that I haven't seen in the years. It's just amazing sitting there listening to song service this morning in person rather than sitting at home listening to it. So uh, we're thankful for the progress that we've made uh, with this pandemic and everything and things are loosening up and uh, we're going to be able to get back and start doing a lot of our uh, activities that we had uh, canceled due to the COVID. And uh, we just had an outreach from uh, one of our uh, homes that we did uh, services for, asking for us to come back and to uh, start those up. So we look forward to that. Hopefully you've gotten a bulletin today and looked through it. There's a lot of information there. Uh, First of all, it says it's a youth celebration day, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Remember, Shire of the People is uh, still going on. Uh, ladies' virtual book study. They've had uh, two lessons now, and I understand uh, that uh, the discussion is very, very good and very informative, and uh, that's going very well. Uh, the 23rd is a Sunday evening sing service. Uh, there's an announcement in the bulletin regarding that. Uh, senior adult lunch trip is uh, starting back on May 27th. So if you'd like to participate in that, again, there's announcements in the bulletin. And this one kind of intrigued my interest. It says, Sweets Under the Sunset, May 29th at 6.30. That is for our... Uh, uh, youth, and it's going to be held at uh, Brian and Melissa Bishops. Uh, so uh, look for that if you uh, want to participate in that. Also, we need to remember uh, Beverly Sexton. Uh, we have a special prayer request for her and, and uh, the problems that she's dealing with, and uh, just continue to remember her. Uh, See if there's anything else I missed. I don't believe there's anything. Oh yeah, ladies' Bible class. Some nice pictures here in the bulletin of the ladies' Bible class. I want to commend the ladies' Bible class. I understand that uh, they made a sizable donation to James Jones and the orphanage that uh, he works with over in Africa. Uh, the other day, they had uh, lost one of their cows, and uh, that was uh, in Africa. They're kind of precious commodity and uh, the, they didn't have any way to get fresh milk and so the ladies Bible class uh, made a donation that they could uh, purchase one or two cows uh, for that orphanage so we commend them for that. As we mentioned today is a uh, youth celebration day. We like to set aside time each year to recognize our youth. And it's incumbent upon us as leaders of the church, as 
parents, grandparents, that we teach our children about God. Because if we don't, one day the church will disappear. So uh, I'm very thankful for our teachers here that we have and also for our youth and uh, the programs that we have. And we continue to look for ways in which we can uh, help educate those. But the church itself cannot do it all. It's up to you parents and grandparents to do that. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Corey to come up and uh, make a few comments uh, in regards to this. A few years ago, the elders came to me and, and brought up this idea of the, the youth celebration service. And so the past few years, we've done this and just recognized our, our youth and our children um, who are such an important part of this congregation. And again, I'm just so thankful for the blessing, uh, the blessings that they have uh, in this church of so many uh, people who care about them, not only parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, but a loving church family, a wise church family that they can learn from and uh, grow with. So um, I'm going to ask the youth and children, all the high school age and below to come up. Uh, I want the youth group age kids on this side of the stage and the younger kids here. So uh, you guys start making your way up here, please. So you guys don't just leave me up here hanging. But while they're making their way up, I wanted to also um, recognize we have a, a young man that is here this morning. He's um, talking with the elders, meeting with them about interning with us this summer. His name's Austin Pierce. Uh, so if you see him with, he'll probably be with me or Josh or uh, one of us, and we would love for you to get to know him and uh, meet him this morning. All right. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to ask Davis to conclude us in a word of prayer for these young people and the elders to come up with that. And um, it is a neat thing. Uh, I think um, two weeks ago we had the time where we said kind of goodbye to our seniors, uh, which was a, a hard thing to do. Um, and I didn't know if Anna Claire would acknowledge herself or any of the one, other ones that were here would acknowledge themselves. Uh, as youth group members, I guess they have distanced themselves from us already. That's fine. That's fair. Uh, Janisha and Sam came in this morning. They don't acknowledge me anymore. You know, it's all right. And Shelby's back. Um, but it is a blessing to see so many of our young people. It's so, uh, for me, it's so rewarding to, to see them, you know, to see Alex as a song leader and Austin lead singing as well. And uh, to see Owen come back and be here. And there's just to see our kids remain involved in this congregation, and they're hardly not kids anymore, all of those that Alex and Austin know, and they're all in their mid-20s or so, and um, you know, it's, it's just such a great experience to see them continue to be active and a part. Um, again, with graduating seniors, we moved up three of our um, sixth graders coming up for seventh graders. Um, so Savannah and then Kylie and Lily all moved up to the youth group. That was the week after our graduating ceremony. We did the kidnapping that we sometimes do. Uh, again, something that taken out of context, kind of like when we were showing the pictures uh, for our slideshow. And I thought, I really need to explain the context because there's a lot of stuff that we do that kind of looks weird. So, uh, but the kidnapping, we would love to explain to you sometime. Uh, we kind of do that for our seventh graders that are upcoming. But I'm going to turn it back over to Davis and have him lead a prayer uh, for these wonderful kids. And uh, again, just if you see them today, love on them, tell them how much you care about them, and uh, tell them uh, that you're praying for them. Thank you. It's powerful. John? Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you, Father, for the many blessings of life. Father, to thank you for all these young uh, children and youth that uh, we have here and we just uh, pray that you would continue to bless them as they continue to grow and to study your word help us as individuals as as friends parents elders 
grandparents, aunts and uncles to always instill in them a desire to continue to learn more and more about you. And when it comes time to make their decision to uh, give their life to you in a gospel obedience, that they would have the courage and the knowledge to, to do so, Father. Father, we're so thankful for everything that we have here at Charlotte Heights and for everything that you bless us with. Continue to be with us as uh, we continue to work and labor here in this community. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.